I'll make, give you a very, very nice overview of the challenges of facing the development and research and development of a, of a lithium ion battery. I'm going to follow up on that and give you a slightly different perspective on, uh, uh, to, to lay out the, the, um, the challenges and also then I'll give you a few examples. Very briefly, uh, work done at Northwestern University and uh, to, together with Argonne. So, well, um, what we would like to do as a set up as a challenge is to replace um, uh, engines in an automobile by battery. By elect uh, essentially, we want to have an electrified car, electric, electricity driven car. But if you look at it, essentially, what we are talking about is that this is the internal combustion engine that we have today. It runs with the efficiency of converting gas, energy in gasoline to energy in move, moving power with a, of about 17 to 17 percent, between 15 and 20 percent on the average. And we replace that engine and the, and the gasoline tank with a motor and a, a battery pack. And theoretically, because of the high efficiencies in converting uh, electricity into motion, and high efficiency in, the con in uh, storing and, and using the electricity in the battery, the overall efficiencies can be as high as 70%, converting the energy in the, in the electron to motion. So this increase in efficiencies is a very large driving force for people to, or the driver for people to do research in, uh, in, in batteries. So you're talking about uh, not only using the battery for transportation, we can also talk about using batteries for storage of other um, uh, intermittently produced electricities, such as wind power or solar power. Mm. Well, we, we picked the application for, yeah, for transportation mainly because it's much more demanding. Anything that can be used well for transportation can be easily uh, be adapted to these other applications as well. So as Mike has already mentioned to you, the challenges in electrifying a vehicle or using a electricity to run a vehicle is, is are these points. Safety, reliability, that is you, be able, you want to be able to use the battery for a long time. Convenience uh, in terms of operation and maintenance. Uh, in terms of operation, I'll talk about it a little bit more on that is you want a battery powered car to be able to drive, to be able to uh, 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 run for about 300 50 miles rather than uh, 10 miles uh, and uh, before we charge. And cost of ownership, uh, uh, essentially the cost, right? <clears throat> so let's go to what, what I'll be talking about uh, in the next couple of slides are some examples dealing particularly with uh, the convenience and operation. And I'll lay out to you the background of what we really, really need to accomplish there. So here's the battery. And the, this is, Here's the, the demand that we have. We want it to be able to, the car to be able to run for 350 miles. Currently, if you do that with the gasoline internal combustion engine, we will, we will use a, 50, let's say, 16-gallon 16, 16 uh, gasoline tank, and that packs so much energy into the tank. So essentially, we want to say that we want to pack the equivalent amount of energy to run for that long, that, that far distance, into a battery that runs at 3 volts, uh, and a weight of 500 kilograms. That's about 1,000 pounds. I picked up 500 kilograms because that's about the weight of your engine, internal combustion engine, with the drive chains, transmission, uh, and, so, and so on and so forth. So let's take that as a, as a right number, of about 500, 500 kilograms. So we need to pack the equivalent of that much energy into 500 kilograms, and it's plot here. That's called the energy density. Well, actually, how much we have to pack into it depends on how efficiently you can convert that energy into motion. If you're talking about internal combustion engine of six, uh, equivalent of 17.5% uh, uh, um, uh, efficiency of conversion, uh, you, need, you need to pack a lot more energy into your battery than if you can use 70% of the energy. Right? So you need to pack a lot less energy. So, uh, <coughs> What, so this is a curve then showing you the relationship between how much energy density you need for as a function of the efficiency of the conversion. In, that, in addition to that, we also need to realize that not all the material inside your battery is useful for, for storing an electron. So here's a picture, schematic picture of a battery. Here's the anode, here's the cathode, or the negative electrode and the positive electrode. That's where you have to store the electrons and the energy. But you cannot hold it in your hands. You're going to package it into something uh, such as a current collector here, housing here, and all the connections to the outside world. So there are a lot of this overhead weight that you have to carry around with you. Well, if, uh, if we assume 
that that overhead weight represents something like certain percentage of your energy, of the, of the weight of the total material, and then that, that would then cut into how much energy pack you have to pack into the active material, the anode and the, and the, and the cathode. And here are some of the numbers. Uh, typically, right now, that the, the fraction of weight in your battery, in your lithium-ion battery, that is the active material, is only about 25%, somewhere around here. So if 20% of your, of your battery is the energy storage material, 80% are the housing and other, material, other things, this will be the curve of uh, relating the efficiency of conversion, energy conversion, to the, the energy density of the pack into the material, um, into the anode and cathode. And clearly, the less is this overhead material, let's say suppose you have a battery in which only 40% of dead weight materials, then you only need to pack that much less energy into your active material, making it, make it a lot easier for you to accomplish that. So wh where are we now today in the batteries that we have? This is where we have current commercial lithium-ion battery has an energy packing density of in, the, in the active material only around this number here. Right? That's why the lithium-ion batteries in the hybrids can only run for about 10 miles, not 500 or not 350 miles. In the laboratory, people have accomplished uh, numbers around here. Uh, <coughs> Well, theoretically, knowing what uh, some of the best materials are available for people to do to work with, you can achieve a, a, a number that could be as high as the number there. So here are lies the, some of the challenges or opportunities, and that is how can we pack more energy into the material that, uh, that stores energy here, as well as how to lower the weight of all these accessories that goes around that uh, storage materials. So lightweight material, both in terms of the housing and other packaging as well as lighter weight for and higher energy densi uh, densities for the storage materials, other challenges and opportunities. Well, let me now go to, to uh, some, a few ex uh, specific examples, um, talking about them rather briefly. Um, let's look at uh, this negative electrode. <coughs> I said that the current overall density, energy density, is only around, around 200 or so uh, milliampere hour per milli milli I mean, a watt hour per kilogram. Uh, uh, that's where this is, the carbon that uh, electro is right there. Well, there are a lot of material that are known to, have to be able to store a lot more energy. Silicon, was mentioned already, is one of them. About 10 times more density of energy you can pack into it. So why don't people work with silicon? Well, one of the issues is that they die fast, and this is an example. If you look at the capacity, that's how much energy you can pack into that uh, silicon, versus how many times you charge and discharge it, the cycles. That number th dies off rather rapidly, it's right here. But what one would like to do is to be able to stabilize this, rather than having it dying, uh, you have it as, uh, 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 be able to maintain the capacity for many cycles of charging and discharging. Uh, for applications, uh, the type of application we envisioning that for op automobile applications, we need to be able to maintain this charge-discharge uh, uh, capacity for at least a thousand cycles not 10 or 20. Well, what we have been looking at in along this direction is, uh, is how to stabilize this drop in, this, in the capacity. Well, one, by understanding how, why that occurs, uh, we thought that what we can do is to take this silicon material, all these little black dots, and uh, protect them or by encapsulating them with a carbon material. This carbon material is, uh, is uh, electrically conducting, uh, and uh, a very thin layer of it, that this little dot of silicon is only about 20 nanometer in size. So we want to form a very thin layer of this protective carbon. And indeed, by forming this protective carbon, you stabilize the material uh, much better than without it, but still it's not good enough. Um, now, with, this, with the carbon protecting material, one immediately, immediately, immediately can think of other carbon materials as well, such as graph graphenes. Now, graphenes are made of uh, graphite, uh, components of graphite. Now, these are the graphite. This is uh, the lubricant that you are uh, familiar with. Uh, and they are, they are uh, made of sheets of this ring-type carbon structures. And they're very loosely bonded. Between the sheets are loosely bonded together. You can do chemistry and other met methods to separate these sheets into individual sheets, and those are called graphene layers. The graphene layers are very special. They are very hard mechanically, and they're electrically very conducting. 
In that, in fact, if we can take this, we can disperse this graphene, graphene material into a polymer, and that's done a lot of question by uh, the chemistry professors here. Um, you can disperse it in the, in the, into a, a, a uh, non-conducting polymer material and make the, that polymer conducting. As little as only one way percent of this graphene can make that, uh, that polystyrene quite conducting already. So one can think of using this kind of material as part of the package for the, uh, of the uh, uh, silicon to make the anode. Uh, indeed, that can be done. Uh, this is uh, the graphene layers here, and these are the little sil uh, silicon nanoparticle particle dots that I showed you in the last slide. And this is then the, uh, the this, uh, 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 stability in the charge discharge cycle in terms of the maintenance of the uh, charge uh, capacity. So things can be improved, uh, but uh, when need more work needs to be done. And you might notice that now, with this, old, this kind of composite materials, we get a, ch a charge density of the order of about 800 uh, uh, milliampere hour per gram, uh, about three times better than the, co the current materials. Well, we don't, we don't only need to work on these materials on, on, the anode, on the anode side, the negative electrode side, we need to also work on the positive electrode side as well. Right now, getting this material, this composite, is only part of the picture. I said that you need to package it into, into a battery as a whole. Well, their work at, at Northwestern, they can point to this direction. You can take silicon materials, as represented by this little red, uh, blue dots, and uh, deposit and uh, make a composite of it with, uh, with graphene sheets. And then you can put the whole thing and, uh, into some kind of resin and, uh, and, uh, and assemble them into... Uh, 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 structures like this, you know, micro structures like this, eventually package them into sheets, microscopic sheets, that they can roll into a battery or you can lay them into battery layers. So there are, there are also expertise at Northwestern that, are, that allow, allow people to do these hybrid micro uh, nanocomposite uh, structures. <coughs> um, in a, well, I also mentioned that weight of the other dead weight material, uh, portion of the battery is very important. Um, well, electrical contact uh, connections, which is made of copper rods, big chunks of copper, are, are very heavy. If you can get, you can achieve the same purpose uh, functions with a much lighter weight uh, material, that will be better. One way to make to do that is to use metal foams. Metal foams are uh, uh, have a lot of void space in between the, the metal uh, metal parts, so that the weight is much lighter for that matter. So if you can develop <coughs> develop metal foams for the, the connect uh, for the electrical connections, as well as for the packaging, for the housing, you would then the whole bat battery that 80% or so, or 70% or so of the weight of the weight can be reduced. Uh, what if you not only try to uh, re, uh, uh, use metal forms, but also make metal forms that has uh, that uh, that has no uh, um, penalty on the electrical conduction, such as you fill up this little voice between the forms by electrically conducting lightweight polymers or lightweight materials. Now, those are all the, all the possibilities that can be done. Well, another way of looking at uh, of, of, of utilizing the metal forms would be, to not, uh, would be to use the forms directly as part of the electrodes, of all those, uh, all those uh, electrically, con uh, 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 I mean the uh, electricity uh, storage materials. And that is work that's done uh, essentially um, mostly by, by, uh, supervised by, by Mike Zachary, the, the last speaker, and in collaboration with us. And this is the type of foamy material that one can use to deposit the, electric, uh, the, uh, the storage, the electricity storage materials. And you can get pretty good capacity for a while. Uh, we don't understand why the, this, this drops so suddenly. We think it's due to some failure of the battery in other parts rather than, uh, rather than the, the storage material itself. So those are some of the examples that I think we, uh, what one can uh, uh, work with together with uh, Northwestern and, um, and, uh, and uh, Argonne, uh, capitalize, capitalizing on the expertise at both places. Here's another uh, potential uh, um, uh, collaborative efforts that can make a big difference in my mind. And that is, uh, here, that is in order for people to really, uh, to, in order to facilitate and, uh, and uh, assist research and develop the development in batteries, we need to have a world-class characterization facilities that is, that is not yet available in the world, anywhere in the world. And that is to be able to characterize the material under operating conditions. Well, now that is a big challenge. And you need to make use of to be developed uh, 
capabilities, um, and making use of what's already available at, uh, at the Northwestern and at Argon. So for example, uh, we need to understand the, in, the, the interface right here between the uh, electrically, electricity um, uh, collecting material and the, uh, and the uh, uh, electrolyte, for example. This is where the chemistry takes place, and the, often that's where the failure takes place as well. Well, we need to characterize what that is under reaction conditions and their techniques, such as the glancing uh, incident X-ray techniques, the standing X uh, 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 X -ray, standing wave X-ray techniques, for example, is one of them. And Northwestern is very well equipped to do that kind of techniques, as you heard earlier um, uh, in, uh, in a couple of talks before. Peter Stair also talked about the, the uh, Raman uh, techniques that has been used for catalysis. One can adapt that to, to look at the uh, uh, electrode interfaces as well, uh, especially with the ability to do multi-wavelength Raman spectroscopy that can look at, they can selectively identify certain groups to, uh, to, to study. Uh, that is the fundamental part. Uh, after you make the material, the, you need to characterize it not only in terms of chemistry, but in terms of its performance. You need to look at the, the, the charge, the charge behavior packaged into, a, uh, into a, 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 back, a battery pack so that you can put it into the car and actually run it. And those are facilities that are re really already available at, at, uh, at Argon that one can make use of. So uh, this is an example, I think, would be something that can make a big uh, difference in the development of lithium-ion battery. That's all I have to say. Thank you.